Uh, my name is Ed Bedrosian. I'm an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. Um, I practice in San Francisco, California, uh, but for the last 25 years I've been the director of the implant surgical training at the University of Pacific's oral and maxillofacial residency training program. Uh, I'm also the director of implant uh, surgical training at the undergraduate University of Pacific Dental School. You know, the recent advancement in implant dentistry has been the appreciation and adoption of the graftless approach in treating the dentulous patient or the terminal dentition patients. So I think there's a um, lot more enthusiasm among our colleagues and, uh, and, and a very positive reception and an extremely high need to, uh, to understand the, the treatment planning concepts uh, for this group of patients. You know, go, um, along with the uh, in increased interest in treatment of the edentulous patient and adoption of the graftless approach, the zygomatic implant has had a rebirth, if you will. And I think one of the reasons is because the more zygomatic implant is used as a, an implant at the beginning when you only have zone one bone. When you have zone one, zone two, you go to tilted. When you have zone one, zone two, or zone three, you go into axial implants. But what happens when your zone 2 implant fails or your zone 2, 3 implant fails and your uh, bone grafts fail? Well, the zygoma implant is the go-to implant. So I think a lot of the experienced practitioners have identified that they need to have an algorithm where, where, where they can now fall back on their axial implants. And if the axial implant does not work, tilted implant. If the tilted implant doesn't work, zygoma implant. And this can happen throughout the treatment, over the, the six, seven months of treatment, or it can happen intra-op. You intend to put a tilted implant in, and you can't get primary stability. So the go-to go implant is a zygoma. So the zygoma implant has uh, uh, had a rebirth only because, uh, not only as an initial implant, but as a rescue implant on, on, on managing of complications. Uh, so uh, with the graph, going along with the graphless approach, um, the more we hear and the more we listen to the application of the treatment planning, the systematic treatment planning uh, protocol that we uh, at our university have developed, it, the, the much easier uh, it becomes to understand how to treatment plan patients. So this new lecture that we have, this new video, uh, highlights four patients, two are tilted implants, two are zygoma implants, with unique um, uh, situations. And it gives you a lot of pearls, clinical pearls. What I use myself uh, in my office and what I teach my residents uh, to do, um, and adopting these uh, protocols and, and, and applying them to di different patient types, uh, the more of those you see, the more confident you become because you start seeing the repetition of patterns. And it's the same thing. When something is being repeated over and over, it's usually a hallmark of a, 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 a predictable outcome and a predictable procedure. One of the important things for me, uh, and I mention it over and over, is identifying the difference between a tooth-only defect and a composite defect patient. If, uh, if you were to take out teeth on a, on a person who has no periodontal disease, let's say because of gross caries, they will be a tooth-only defect patient. They will have no, they only have room for white, a PFM or a ceramic metal type of prosthesis. They do not have room for the componentry for an overdenture or for a hybrid. On the other side, if you take a hybrid patient and try to make him a PFM prosthesis, they will have extremely long teeth. And I, I, I joke about it, I say they will look like a horse or a hamster, but that is true. They will, they will have extremely anesthetic long teeth. Now, so identifying whether your patient is a tooth-only defect patient or identifying whether they're a hybrid patient is absolutely important. But the other thing I really want to make clear, clear is this. You will hear a lot of conversation about the way to treatment plan your patient is to mount the case and measure the inter-arch space looking for 18 millimeters or 19 millimeters, whatever the number they give you. If, you've to, if you were to follow that, then you are going to make all of your patients who have less than 18 millimeters into art space into 18 millimeter into art space patients. Another way, another way of saying that is you're going to make all your tooth only defect patients into a composite defect. So yes, you need 18 millimeters to, to make a predictable hybrid prosthesis. You can measure that after you mounted it, but you clinically have to verify whether your patient is a tooth only defect or a composite defect. Very nice, very important, very academic, but 
Don't forget number three. No matter whether they're, if they're a composite defect patient, you must make sure the transition line is hidden. On a PFM case, whether the smile line is high or low, doesn't really matter because the PFM better be in the right place. In a hybrid case done perfectly, if the smile line is high, the line between the, the prosthesis and the gingiva will show and the case will be an a, a aesthetic disaster. So composite defect, tooth only defect, and transition line go hand in hand with each other. Even though it looks like my life is uh, all on four and zygoma, I do enjoy boating and I do enjoy uh, you know, the long drives on, on, on uh, interesting cars. So with my, uh, my boys who are now 26 and 25 and some, some of their friends, we try to do that as much as possible. And then as far as sports go, skiing has been our family hobby. Um, and water skiing and, and spending a lot of time on the water. So we try to get some uh, fun out of it, even though it looks like I only know PowerPoints and graphless approach. For more education programs, visit the Guide Institute at www.guidedental.com.